Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, so I got up here earlier and asked Robbie how he wanted to be introduced and we basically came up with, this is uh, Robbie Mackay who does code and stuff uh, and he will tell you about him <laughs> during his talk. So hands together for Robbie. Right, thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Robbie. Um, as I said, I do code. Um, just to kind of start with a bit of background about like why this talk and why does it, why do I care? Why does it even matter? Um, so a few years ago, I used to work for a nonprofit that did lots of kind of citizen reporting, anything from earthquakes, disasters, election response, all sorts of stuff. Um, and a lot of what we did deployed to basically the middle of nowhere. Um, memorably, I think the first project I worked on when I got there was deployed in the Central African Republic, which had like at best dial-up internet, <laughs> right? It was very slow, very patchy, um, and we tried, we were at the time trying to make like offline work with the, you know, beginnings of local storage and some kind of app cache and like, but none of it really worked at the time, right? So part of this talk is me kind of going like, if I were to build it all again, um, if I were gonna try and design something actually to work with you know, 2020 technologies, what might it look like? Um, and there's kind of a couple of bits to that. Like the other bit of that, that nonprofit in particular is that a lot of the data we had, we didn't necessarily want to have. They did things like human rights reporting in countries that didn't necessarily like you doing human rights reporting. Um, and you don't really want to send all the data back to a central server where they can look at it all and check what's going on. You want to, like, you want to keep the data on one machine and send it to the other machine and just keep it there, right? Um, so part of, that's kind of part of the motivation. The other part is this. This is what a lot of offline apps still look like, right? They are not connected, sorry, by, or worse, this site cannot be reached. We cannot do anything, right? So basically, this is the question of, like, can we actually build an offline app, but more so can we build an offline app where you can share data from A to B without being online? So kind of to go through quick goals, right? Can you build something that's offline first so you can view, but you can also edit, you can search, you have all your data when you're offline. Um, I guess actually the other the question, quick show of hands, who has built PWAs or offline apps before? Okay, more than I would have thought actually given the state <laughs> of some of the weird stuff around. Um, and then like, can you share some data offline and the thing I really wasn't sure of when I was trying to come up with this talk was like, can you do it with just a browser? Do you, you know, it's one thing to do it in a mobile app and another to be like, can I make a browser share data from one to the other without, you know, having a server in the corner? Um, and then kind of riffing on that idea of like, I don't want their data is can I get the data from peer, from peer to peer without a central server? I don't want to hold your data. I don't need it, whether it's financial information or health information or human rights reporting. Like, sometimes it would be better to architect your app to not hold someone's data if you don't need it. So that's kind of my rough list of goals, rough framing of like why this talk, what am I trying to do? Um, and really just to see whether like, is, is there something to still chase here given current tech? Um, so I'm gonna start with kind of a bit of like what are the building blocks that we build on? Not necessarily like, there's a lot of different tools for this. I've just picked the one I could manage to make work. Um, it's not necessarily the best one. <laughs> there are definitely others and it's like, along with all of the like hype about things like Bitcoin, there's been a lot of development in this space at the time. So there's a lot of other things to look at like beyond what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but so the main, Main tool I'm looking at as like the base is a thing called Hypercore. So Hypercore basically, it, this is like your kind of network data exchange layer for, for your offline content, for your like decentralized content, right? Um, and it's a collection of a bunch of things which we'll get into a little bit more. Um, the basics of it is that it's this kind of append-only log. So you just keep adding data to it. You never delete data. The kind of advantage of this is it makes it easy to easier to send things back and forth. Um, it's a little bit easier for it to sync and like exchange data. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that I'm not even like, I don't totally understand every detail, but it works and it, that's, that was enough. Um, 
And then on top of that, there's a thing called Kappa DB, which basically gives you, like, rather than just a bunch of blocks of, like, whatever shape data you want, how do we turn this into something more usable? Um, and so if you're familiar with event sourcing as a thing, like, Kappa basically layers that on top of Hypercore. Um, so you have a bunch of events. Instead of kind of your more traditional, oh, I've got a table of, you know, my example here is, like, just the classic to-dos. Right? Instead of a table of all my to-do items, I'll have a bunch of events. I add a to-do, I update a to-do, I remove something. Um, and Kappa just gives you this like map function. You throw it through a map and turn it into some kind of view on your client. Right? So you're never exchanging that, like, what is the current state? You're exchanging a bunch of, like, what changed in the state. Um, the other nice bonus of this in a front-end context is it maps kind of nicely onto, like, a Redux store or Vuex as your mutations actually match, kind of, right? So what does this actually look like? You know, in this example, although you can shape it differently, but in this example, right, like, it looks like a blob of data that is add a to-do item, which says do the thing and isn't complete, and then, like, delete one, right? Um, and just to do a quick run through the kind of stack that you don't really need to know what all these do, basically, you have hypercore on the bottom, Multi-feed is this thing that just manages lots of different hypercores floating around exchanging data. And then to build our views, we build them on LevelDB, which is basically a key value store. Sits in the, will run on the browser or a node or kind of anywhere you want it to be. Yeah. And then you kind of build your own views and indexes on top of that. So let's, I'm going to dive into a little bit to how to set up, and then I'll kind of do a couple of quick demos. Um, so obviously, install the thing. Um, setting it up is pretty straightforward. The only really interesting bit at this stage is that like, you can inject a bunch of different storage drivers. So if you're running this in Node, you can store to disk. If you're running it in a browser, you can inject an IDB driver and, install, and store into IndexedDB. Um, but it's pretty, you know, we just create, create some storage, basically. Um, and then if you want to do something with that, so we set up a writer, so that basically gives us a feed of, like gives us, in Kappa you can get a bunch of different feeds. Most of them will be read, but you get what you say, give me a write feed, um, then I'm gonna add something to it, and that just pushes it onto that append only log. Um, yeah, and then to get data out of that again, you need some kind of view on top of it, so we have a record view. It, we're just giving that another level DB storage. Nothing really revolutionary. It's kind of all just set up at this point. Um, and then each view kind of adds a bunch of API calls onto whatever API, whatever you named it. So in this case, records, right? Um, so this would just give you an API to go and like get all of the data that it's got seen from anyone um, and log it all out. So I'll give you a quick example, stepping through this data. Let me just see if I can switch screens. All right, can we see that? That's a good start. All right, so this is just stepping through that data I had before. So we add this, like, put record. So you add it to do, and then that the second line is just our current state. Um, so you add a to-do, then we add a second one, so now you've got a list of two, oh, fairly obvious, right? Um, and then you add a delete onto your log, and so that removes one of those, and then you might add, you know, an update that marks this one as true. So it's kind of just like, if you think about this like Redux or Vuex or something, you're just kind of pushing mutations into your store, right? Um, it's fairly straightforward. So how does that view layer work? Because a lot of this, you still kind of have to build a bit of your view layer. So we have, we create our view. This DB here is your level DB object coming in, just so that we know what that is. Um, you have a map function. This will get, like, entries is always just the latest batch of data. So that might be the latest batch in terms of I just added an item. It might be the latest batch in terms of 20 items just came in from another client, from another machine or somewhere, right? 
or it might just be we're restoring everything and it's rerunning this, um, re-indexing. And one of the neat bits of Kappa as well is like you can bump versions on these so that it will re-index the whole thing when you bump the version on it. Um, so you're in a batch, we're doing a pretty basic implementation in this instance, we're just mapping everything, either turning you know, delete or put into this batch then just goes into um, level DB at the end. So it's kind of just pushing everything into level DB. And then the other side of that is we have a really simple API out the other end. Um, we either get an item out of level DB or we can get all of the items out of level DB. Um, let me just switch my screen, two seconds. All right. So how do we actually share the data from one to the other? So it's very nice, like we've set up, Hyper, set up Kappa. It's basically a glorified index DB right now because you're still just throwing it all into a local storage or, on, or into memory. Um, so this is where the other bit of Hypercore comes in, which is Hyperswarm. So this is like, how does it find, if you're on a network, how do, I find someone else's machine, or do they find me, or do I find a server that's sitting holding data, right? Um, and this is kind of the interesting bit of it. And so half of this is this like distributed hash table crazy thing, which is sort of the same way that BitTorrent works if you want some kind of reference. Um, it's the same way that, that goes and finds peers. And then for like local networks, it does multicast DNS, which is basically to say it shouts at everyone on the network and, and says like, hi, I'm here, I'm sharing this data. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick step through how the DHT stuff works. It's a little bit fuzzy, and if you don't follow every detail, it doesn't totally matter. <laughs> but it's kind of worth going through a bit. So basically, the idea of this like to get distributed hash table or routing table, right, is that we assign kind of every peer some kind of value on on like the circle is is basically our our space of addresses, right? So we assign every machine, every peer on the network a value. And then if you want to go look for something, you basically ask the closest peer. So you say you're looking for this pink thing here, you know you want value X, Y, Z. Um, and it will find the nearest machine to that, right? And sometimes you'll kind of find the nearest machine and will go off and ask another machine and they'll send back a response and we do a few iterations of this, right? Um, so basically you kind of iterate through and keep going until you find the closest possible value you can get, and that'll give you like the address for that peer. The exact details of that are like some really horrifically long academic paper. <laughs> so that didn't even have pictures, so I kind of gave up. <laughs> too hard, too much for me. Um, but the actual like, how do you use this and how do you make it happen is not nearly as complicated as it might sound. Right? Um, so this is all of the code to like join a swarm and replicate. Um, the main bits that matter are you call join on some kind of topic. Um, and you can see on this first line that I forgot to highlight, um, the topic is just some kind of hash. So this is the one thing that you need to share somehow with any other peer beforehand. It's kind of the equivalent of like a big long Google Docs URL or something. You need to send them like, this is the ID of my document and my data. Um, so you join that topic, it goes away and does all that complicated DHT stuff to find people. Um, and you wait for a connection. And then we come back and once you've got a connection, we basically, the main part of this line that matters is that like core replicate bit, which basically generates a stream of like, here is all the data I've got. And we fire that over to the other person, they do the same thing. Suddenly we all have each other's data in a big pile and then you let Kappa kind of handle the rest of that, right? Um, so alongside that, you can just kind of listen for what actually changed. So I'll show you, oh, I'll switch my screen, and I will show you how this works again. Um, so this is local network. I mean, I'm online, but this would work whether you were just tethered to your phone or anything. Obviously, you need some connection between machines, but so we run this, the swarm connects, they both shout about having new peers. They're shouting twice because they will actually connect over like UDP, UDP and TCP, just in case. 
Um, and then if we type a message, ignore my junk, um, it just adds that to the log. So we're just listening standard it out. And you can see like that syncs over to my other client over here. Um, and so we can send mes messages back and forth. Really uninteresting as a demo, but you know it shows that we've connected at least. This would work with only a local network. It would work if you were somewhere out, you know, on somewhere back at your hotel still. Pretty, I don't know. It's kind of neat. Like it's kind of kind of fun that you can just find people, and like the MDM, the the multicast DNS will just find people as well. I, when I was first working on this, I was doing it like sitting in a cafe with no internet, just like a couple of machines going, can I make this work? Oh, it actually sends messages. Um, so then the tricky bit of this, though, to answer that question I said earlier is like, can we do this with just a browser? The answer is kind of not, <laughs> sadly. If you're in a browser, the only way you have to talk to other people is hit a server somewhere that you know about or talk over WebRTC. Um, and so there's this addition to Hyperswarm that will do some of that, right? So it'll either proxy Hyperswarm over a local server, or it will build a whole DHT network, a slight modification of it over WebRTC. Um, it gives you your signaling server and everything else that you need. Um, so in the case of like, if you're doing an Electron app, you can just bundle this in. It's really easy. It's one command, it runs. Um, if you're doing a mobile app, you can kind of run this in the background. But you're kind of stuck if you're just a browser. You need to have some way to lo load it locally, right? Um, there's all sorts of weird things you could do to kind of bootstrap WebRTC, but none of them really work. <laughs> um, all right, so just to give us a more concrete demo of this, though, um, I'm going to jump in and I'm just going to switch again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we've got a to-do list, the classic, like, it's, a, it's literally the 2D2 MVC with the PWA layered on top. Um, this is all built in Vue. So, and I credit to someone else who I will have credited somewhere later in my slides who built this app in the first place. I just added to it. Um, so it's kind of a standard Vue setup. You have Vue X, which if you don't know Vue, but you know React is like Redux, but for Vue, um, we have a really simple data store. It basically has edit, delete, you know, Mark has done, to like toggle on and off. It has all, all the standard things you do with a to-do. Um, and then to kind of connect into that and add our Kappa DB and Hypercore, we have a little plugin that just adds into create store and adds a plugin. And that plugin just hooks into a couple of things. It's actually, this is where like, having mutations and mapping them onto your data store pays off, right? Um, is you subscribe to every single mutation, um, and there's a little bit of logic here just to make sure we've actually got the current state off the stack, not like whatever came with the mutation. But that's kind of immaterial. It's mostly just view being weird. Um, so we subscribe to, subscribe to that, and then we push it onto the log, right? Um, we push it, so yeah. And then we do the reverse as well, as we subscribe to batch, which is kind of a, like any batch of changes came in. Um, we subscribe to that, and we just map it straight back onto the store. You could probably do a better job of this. This is my very naive, like, overwrite the whole data store implementation, but <laughs> it does the job. Um, so I will show you how that actually works. And we'll see if I can successfully break it as well. <laughs> All right, so we have it to do. Um, this one's already been running, so you can sort of see in the log we've already connected to the peers. So if I, you know, add my to-do items, you know, <laughs> this was me yesterday. You can see it instantly updates on this other window, right? Um, and you can delete them. You can mark them as done. It'll all kind of sync. If I come in and find my, so this is my little like hyperswarm server, and kill that. 
And actually, weirdly, as a side effect of being over WebRTC, that doesn't kill your connection. So I'm going to reload everything, because otherwise it keeps its connection around. <laughs> it's a little bit like too resilient for this demo, which is unhelpful. Um, so if you come in here, and then you know I clear completed over here, and I don't know. We edit this to say something else. Um, and actually, we mark this as not done over here. And then we go back in and like fire this up again. So I'm just going to reload them, because it forces them to re-peer, and it won't make us sit around waiting for quite so long. <laughs> Hopefully, give it a second, and it should say that it found something. It does take a little while to just figure itself out, unfortunately. Like once it's connected, it's really good. So the thing you're going to notice immediately, which is my fault and the fault of my like really naive view implementation earlier, is that they're not quite in sync, right? <laughs> they're updated, but we've run into like now we have the classic kind of distributed systems problem. Um, and this is sort of the problem with this. At the point where you start doing syncing and anything in a local app, it gets a little bit harder. And this isn't really the fault of Hypercore. It's just the fault of like your syncing stuff. You're now in a, in a distributed system. You have multiple versions of your data that don't necessarily match. Um, and the kind of classic distributed systems things start to bite you, and it sucks. <laughs> um, so you get unreliable ordering of all your like of all those messages. So one of them saw we you know, deleted an item, and we edited it on the other side, and then they synced. And so this one saw the delete come afterwards and deleted it, and this one saw the edit and put it back again. Um, so this is like you have some edits. You want them to do this and order themselves nicely, and actually they did this. <laughs> and it wasn't very friendly. Um, and so they're all out of order and all over the place. And so there are actually some really nice solutions to this. I'm going to kind of cover the simplest one before I run out of time. Um, so the simplest thing to do to start with is you add a clock, um, and you add a timestamp, right? Um, and so the timestamp here is what's called a hybrid logical clock, which is like, again, another complicated paper that I didn't read. All I know is that it works, and it gives you something that is kind of a timestamp and it's always bigger, but it doesn't, it deals with like the clock drift and other stuff for you. <laughs> but all I know is you just tell it to give you a clock, a timestamp, and you're good, right? Um, and so to show you a bit of how this actually works, um, you've got, say we've got these series of events, right? And in this case, I've just given the timestamp as one, two, three. All that matters is you can see one is bigger than the other. Um, so you apply one of them, you get this state of a to do item. We apply the next one, and we've updated it, and now it's marked as done. And you apply the last one, and it's deleted, right? And so then what happens if you swap these around, and how do you handle that? Again, you apply one of them, and you've got your to-do item created. We apply this next one, and we're deleted. And then you get to this last one, and you go, oh, the timestamp's lower than the one we've already got, so we just ignore that. And we don't do anything, and you end up with both at the same state, right? This is basically what's called a last right wins map. Um, and I'm, it's a type of CRDT, which I'm putting here mainly because if anyone's interested, this is what you Google to find out all the other ways to result, like to actually resolve conflicts in your data, because there are a lot of them. And there's a lot of them that will work really bloody well. <laughs> this is the, like, the simplest version. Um, and I can show you a quick demo of like, what does this look like? Once again, we're on the wrong screen. All right. So a quick demo. Oh, why do you have all that data? <laughs> OK. That one should know nothing, but we'll see if this will sync up properly. Yeah, I think I've got, like, what am I connected to? I don't think these things are connected to the same thing. 
They should be talking to each other, but I think one of them is talking to the wrong one. I'm just going to delete all our data for a second, and so all of this in, the, in both of these is running in IndexedDB. So let's delete everything and see if we can get this to actually do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Press all the wrong keys. Of course, because we're live. Okay. With some luck, we can try this again, and we'll do the same little, like, delete, whatever. Have you found each other yet? <laughs> Please hold. It's going to sit there and churn for a minute. Hopefully my thing is still running. It might just implode. <laughs> so in theory, this is like implements all of that last right wins map pretty naively. Basically, we just keep track of the timestamp on top of everything. I'm not sure if this is going to actually find itself. That's really annoying. Just restart everything and hope for the best. Alright. You still haven't found anything. Okay. Oh, now you have. Okay. I think this one's finally got the right version. There we go. Winning! <laughs> the worst. Why, why would I decide to do a live demo? <laughs> it's just asking for trouble. All right. So once again, we'll delete this one, and we'll change it over here. And then we'll fire up this again. Oh, wait, did I just forget? Yeah, I did. Sorry, I forgot to like reload a window, and so it didn't actually disconnect at all. We'll delete you. Okay. Run the server again. All right. Hey, you have the same state. It works. <laughs> It's always novel. Um, yeah. So that kind of gives you the rough, like, the very sim the simplest possible conflict resolution, right? Um, so there's a few issues with this thing, obviously. Um, we still need the signaling servers or the Hypeswarm proxy, as I said. So, like, we, ne we don't get to our pure browser implementation, which I would have really liked. It doesn't matter that much. Like, building this in an Electron app kind of makes more sense. Um, so the other one is that, like, I don't know if anyone remembers old school Skype, like, before Microsoft bought it, where if no one else was online in the chat, like, you wouldn't, the message would never send unless you were both online at the same time. This has that problem, <laughs> right? So if no one's, if you're never online at the same time as your friend, you're never going to see their messages ever, right? It rely, like, maybe if there's a third party in the middle, but, it, but you have to be in common with some peers at the same time for this to work. Um, and then the other main one, as you kind of see, is like Kappa views are not totally trivial. Um, there's some other neat things, but none of them quite work yet. So that's, it was the one I could get to go. Um, and then just to kind of talk through really quickly, like why is this, why is this interesting? Like why, what is this actually, who actually uses this in reality? Um, these guys build a whole like distributed shared mapping application on this that uses KappaDB. They ship, unsurprisingly, Electron and a mobile app and then publish to web. This thing is actually pretty cool as a thing. Then there's these guys who built KappaDB in the first place, so they're kind of like distributed, decentralized Dropbox and a bunch of other weird grouping things, right? Um, it, does, it does things, it works. Um, so then coming back to like my original question is like, can we actually share some data while offline? Yes, sort of, with the caveat that you need more than a browser, right? Um, so we can view and edit offline, we can share some data with our internet, we can share some data without a central server, we just can't do it with only a browser, right? Um, yeah, so there's kind of the, the like, this is a thing, it's not, what I would say is production ready yet, but, but it's worth playing with. Um, and increasingly, there's a bunch of layers on top of it that are really promising. 
It's just a matter of like, keep an eye on which ones are actually winning, right? So 